Recording is on. Welcome to Deke Style Governance Discussion, Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. Uh, to go over the agenda, a slightly different format I'm trying out, um, kind of three different sections like uh, proposal roundup. Those are things that are like live on uh, in a proposal, whether that's on XDI or mainnet. And then two on the horizon. So these are like proposals that we're working on, but are not yet formal uh, proposals. And then like current happenings, which is just kind of everything else, things that we're checking in on that. Um, so we'll get to the proposal roundup in a, in a little bit, but just uh, go over like the, the current happenings, the things that uh, we'll uh, check we'll check in. I, the XDI base check-in um, worker onboarding proposals. I wanna make sure we have like some time to go over that and see how things are, are checking in. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, that's really the other only thing from, from there that I'm really interested in, in getting to talk about. Um, the proposal roundup, so we now have like two different bases and we have to go over these things on both bases uh, and make sh making sure that we're being diligent uh, and reviewing both of those. Um, so to go over the mainnet uh, proposals first, um, a couple different uh, worker proposals, uh, as always, I think Zet and Sky. Uh, we also have the branding and website from Andre Casa, which I think we've talked about the last uh, couple times here. Um, and then we have two pretty interesting proposals about getting liquidity into Swapper. One, uh, to deposit liquidity into Swapper on XDI. So this would go to 150 ETH it will go to the multi-sig, which will then be uh, half of which will be converted to DAI. And then both that DAI and wrapped ETH will be bridged across into XDAI, deposited into DXDAO base on XDAI, and then from there deposited into the liquidity relayer and then uh, providing uh, liquidity on Swapper there. So this will be the first time uh, that we're providing liquidity uh, on XDI Swapper. Um, so I think this is due to pass in four, four days. Um, and then separate from that, um, there is a deposit funds from the treasury into Swapper mainnet. Um, and so this will take 100 ETH and then uh, Direct to the multi-sig, and the multi-sig will actually be trying out a new relayer that has just been uh, deployed or is in the process of being deployed, um, and that will interact with Swapper mainnet. And then um, while that is being tested um, by the multi-sig, we will be installing a new uh, multi-call scheme that can interact with this relayer, and then the ownership of the relayer and also the LP tokens will go to DXDAO. Um, so I think these two proposals are, are pretty big moves in terms of moving funds around and also providing uh, liquidity uh, to Swapper. Um, anyone have comments or like questions yeah. or thoughts yeah. about those? Related to that, we were just briefly discussing um, getting some, well, trying to build the, a DXD pool on Swapper on XDI, which would be cool. And John had mentioned maybe doing a small DXD farming campaign. And is that, John, I just had a question. Could We can do that because the real layer on XDI is fully open. So we don't need to use the multi-sig. We just need to get DX, X DX DAO some DXD bridged across. And then the, the DAO can actually uh, create a farming pool um, because we don't need a, the new, we don't need a new multi-call, multi right? Is that correct? Well, you're right about the not needing multi-call on, on XDI because there's no whitelist for the XDI multi-call, so you don't need to really ever install a new one. But um, to do a farming pool, we first need to, well, I mean, before any of this, right, we need to release XDI uh, version of Swapper. Um, I believe, is Federico here? Yeah, Federico can kind of give us the latest here. I believe the farming may actually be ready. Yeah. Um, for XDI in the next release. Cool. And, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we can have, I don't think the farming will, like, it depends how we want to, like, what, what we want to do. If we want to maybe have a first release 
with uh, only the routing, which is already a nice feature. Uh, and it works on uh, both, uh, it would benefit both XDI and uh, mainnet. And um, I still think I need some more time to uh, work on the farming. Well, you know, the routing is, is there and it's working. So maybe we can do um, two different releases uh, that both add value. So, but I think I, I'd say uh, the end of next week, probably the farming will be will be ready depending on how tests go. Uh, so that's the the plan, I think. To yeah. have like double releases. Uh, it, Federico, would it be weird to um, on X die release like the like the routing and the farming together? Like, because we're going to use XDI for testing, but obviously we don't want it to break. But w even if we didn't put the farming on mainnet, would it would it be okay to like do the routing and farming together on XDI, like, and then actually do a small a small DXD farming campaign would be the best way to test it on XDI. I mean, I, even if it's like in oh, the end of next week, that'd be fine. But is that a is that something? Or would we only want to release the farming if we're releasing it on both mainnet and XDI at the same time? Or could we lead like earlier with XDI, I guess, is my question. No, uh, we, we can we can definitely do that. We can have farming on only like selected networks. Uh, but um, the point is that the front end is shared among networks. And right now it, it's a bit early for the front end for the farming to be released. So. Yeah. Even if we want to do like the XDI release with the farming, we can do that. Just don't expect it to be perfect at all. If we want to do it like early, uh, that's the, the the thing. So that's why I said maybe end of next week we'll have more uh, a more like polished uh, uh, thing, more more polished front end for for farming, and we'll be ready for uh, uh, another deployment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that makes sense because we're we're kind of operating. There's a couple different moving parts here, and I think like one the the swapper the smart routing is like a big update, big improvement, and I think like that um, it really does kind of uh, make swapper like a, a, a it really improves the product like right now. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Um, and then related to that, we're just starting to get liquidity into both XDI swapper and mainnet swapper, right? These two proposals will, uh, one is four days away and the other is six days away. And then also, you know, if we're gonna be on um, getting the liquidity in XDI, um, we're gonna have to go through, and you know, the proposal process is shorter there, but we're gonna have to go through the proposal process there. So I think probably at the earliest, we would be looking at like middle of, end of next week too, about the first time we would, or maybe Wednesday or Thursday, when we would get liquidity into XDI Swapper, um, and then from there we can like you know start planning the next the next um, stages. But I think both of these um, are just kind of are like the first steps of that. Anything else to say about? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we could talk briefly about well, what are the next proposals after these, right? Maybe that's what we're we're talking about. If we're just getting, um, this is just the initial liquidity for both mainnet and XDI. Basically, we're just doing the wet, the wrapped ETH die pair on, on on both of them to get things started. Um, but presumably, we should probably um, start thinking of another proposal for both um, the mainnet one. I don't know. Maybe we should wait until. The relayer is there to really start doing, um, or we can keep diversifying that. And then for XDI, I think that's a real question that we should start thinking about is like, how much liquidity do we want to put in there and like in what pairs and on and, and promoting um, what? Uh, because like, so right now, the first one should give us basically like the, lar the largest, deepest wrapped ETH die pool on XDI with about like 160,000 um dollars worth of uh liquidity um so we you know we have an opportunity to do more um wanting to minimize our our, our risk there but what are what should we be doing for the next proposal 
for XDI uh, swapper. Uh, just maybe more, um, depending on the pools we're going to do, just more more, uh, more flow of funds and then plan to, like, try to attract <laughs> through farming when that's ready in, in a couple, in a few weeks. It might be interesting to do... Um, 150 ETH, like, maybe a couple more of those just to get it to, like, a more size, I guess. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting because it's X type chain, but um, I think where there's some opportunities maybe on the other stable coins because there's really nothing that I've seen on uh, HoneySwap for USDC or Tether yeah. uh, or SUSD. And those are all things that we are planning to kind of diversify the treasury into anyway. So I think those would be the next steps. Yeah. So just kind of like the simple, basic, like chunk, another chunk of kind of ETH and a stable coin and just get that as like the base of Swapper. And then presumably we can also like attract, there will be maybe some other liquidity that comes in as people are interested in um, XI. And then maybe we also build it through the, the farming stuff. Um, so yeah, anyway, we can talk about that more um, maybe on Friday's call, but just thinking about the proposal process for these so we can like start getting ready for those uh, and start moving on them um, it, before we need it. It could be cool to um, maybe try to like make a really big DXD stake pool and like we incentivize and also XDI team incentivizes that as well. Have you or, talked to them at all, Sky? Because um, yeah. I mean, you're familiar with the easy staking interface, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So they actually are incentivizing liquidity i think on uniswap on mainnet yeah <laughs> easy staking. so i think that would be a good target yeah for mainnet or for on xdi i don't know if, if they're doing it on xdi it'd be good there too but yeah 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 like once once we can put capital in or incentivize alongside them. Um, we've kind of just been waiting. So, okay, we, we should talk more about like specifically, we can have a call with them and like brainstorm and we can come up with a few ideas of what we would want to do. Um, but we've kind of been waiting to like be able to do it before we come up with Yeah, I mean, th this might be like a next step kind of thing, like wait till we get the initial, you know, if we get the biggest, with XDI pool on, on XDI, then we've got Omen live on XDI, and I think that's probably a good time to talk to them, right? Yeah. Once, yeah. Yeah, they're uh, hopefully soon we'll make a, f a handful of uh, like Omen markets also with stake as the collateral. Um, they have one, they made one small test one, but they have been waiting for like us to push this next version so that like people could actually see the markets before they like put more in, I think. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, in theory, right? Like with maybe not the next release, but the release after for a swapper on XDI, we have the routing live, so it would pull in honey swap liquidity. And if we do the deposit for the WETH XDI, you now have basically a better experience than honey swap on the, yeah, on the swap around X day at that point, which would be hopefully awesome. pretty, pretty soon, and then we yeah. can build from there. Yeah, sweet, sweet. They kind of like coming together at once. Also, just a plug for the I saw the DX stats is kind of coming along. It's cool because it's going to be multiple chain, which I think will probably be like the first one that's that's doing that. Um, and then yeah, I mean it was even like the swapper. With Uniswap front end going down, uh, Swapper was actually a good place to to access the Uniswap liquidity or the Swapper Dev, uh, I guess. Once so we'll be looking forward to that release. Um, okay, 
Um, and then just shifting to X die, which were shifting more uh, and more over to. So I actually submitted my worker proposal, which is now boosted. Uh, I think, thank you, Sky. Um, and yeah, there's also a, uh, I think Lee Chen Lee, who's been working on the Mesa, put his proposal there. Um, <clears throat> And I, yeah, I think that was good. I think with my proposal, everything was, as I said, it was like mostly the same. Um, I didn't request any X die rep, but I did in the proposal um, state the amount of like main net rep that this month was was due to, so that when we come back and like reconcile that, we'll, we'll have that. Um, I've bridged before, but I haven't bridged obviously since I've gotten this, uh, since I will get this, but um, yeah, it seems to be um, mostly the same process, but I think the key part that I, I think everyone should do and that I have at the bottom of the proposal is basically just outline specifically um, the DXD compensation for that month and the rep compensation for that month, just so it's documented in the in the worker proposal. Should, should others, um, there's a handful of people uh, like uh, Pritam and... Uh, Keenan and others that will likely be doing X die proposals. And I was kind of thinking they would request some X die rep. Some a lot of the people don't have any X die rep. And okay, you get a tiny about a, a tiny bit for doing a proposal, but could they also just request either the rep for the month worker proposal, or should they also include rep like the equivalent amount of rep they have on mainnet or should that be a separate propo proposal if we're going to do that on a one-off basis i guess my whole point is how do we get people that should have a bunch of rep on x die rep so that they want it, that they can start voting and participating on the x die proposals <laughs> so like you specifically didn't request x die rep right um, right. for a worker proposal, but I, I was thinking all worker proposals would request some X die rep, no? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't have, yeah, I can see that and maybe it is easier to do that. I don't have like a hard and fast rule that I was thinking here. Um, I was thinking like, I wanna make sure that like the compensation part of it that, that we're focused on is the main net rep that that's why we want to make sure and like document um but i think separate from that or yeah yeah i think separate from that is what you're talking about it's like we want to make sure people on x die have rep and x die dx dow right the base there now is a representation of what main net is because that's what it is it's like a base that we kind of birth and are trying to have at least for right now, like the same, you know, the same type of stakeholders, same type of uh, yeah, individuals. Of what it was like in three to four months October, ago. October, yeah. So yeah. a lot. So, like, there's a ton of workers that have missed out on all of that. So they they don't have any rep on X die yet. Um, I definitely think anyone uh, should be able to claim what they have on mainnet. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, I mean, because I'm more like worried about it going the other way, right? Like the X die rep being claimed on mainnet. Um, but I think we should be fine with anyone that has claiming X die rep to match their mainnet rep. Yeah. Um, so, I'm a so little worried about like the counting of all of this, like as we try to like reconcile them. But like, I definitely think it's important that everyone should have yeah. X die rep to, to uh, vote on that. So Dev Violet has a proposal in XDI that he put in actually a while ago, but we has been just sitting there because we didn't, weren't really sure what the plan was. Um, he he asked to just cl clone his rep from Mainnet, which he has earned over the last four months, onto XDI. So that's a good example. Um, that that's on there in like the lower regular proposals. That's a good example of. Uh, of that type of proposal that people could just do to top either top up or initiate their uh, rep on X die to match their main net rep at this point um, to at least get everyone that more involved and get start get voting on proposals. 
So you, you can look at what Milan did and you can replicate that, I guess. Yeah. The only thing I was like, the amount, actually, I think now the reason I didn't do it because I wasn't sure what like amount to use because uh, yeah. I was using the denominator for mainnet for the mainnet rep reward, but I wasn't sure if that amount of rep would be what you would, should claim on X dot. Yeah, that's a very confusing thing. Um, and that's because when we cloned mainnet rep, we did not include the total amount of rep for people that didn't map their yeah their four four or five hundred thousand rep that's that's not there. Um, uh, so what did Dev is Dev Island on here? Yeah. Yeah. So I used it, just the percentage like of the total rep. Uh, to which mean, total rep though? Total rep on X die. Yeah, so your okay. same percentage that you have mm -hmm. on mainnet, you use that same yeah. percentage on next time. Yeah. I think that makes sense, you know. Same impact. Like. Yeah, that's that's it's that's actually different than like what the initial rep mapping was, but it, it at least is better than uh yeah. nothing. Well, if we use the the mainnet one, we would get more percentage wise rep than we should have. Right. Yeah. So maybe we just stick with point one six six seven percent on both, and you just use the different denominator. But, but so Dev is like requesting his. Let's say he has one percent of rep on mainnet. He was requesting one percent of rep on X die according to the total X die rep. So not the monthly worker thing, but he was just doing a, a so. full. -time. So, the, so he was taking 1% and multiplying it by the total rep on X I, which I think yeah. is right. I think is fine. It yeah, I mean, that's, re that's reasonable, but I mean, the initial mapping was using the rep numbers from mainnet. And I think uh, to be consistent with that, it may make sense to keep doing the number. And also another reason to do that is you could imagine since X die is more usable or gas, like the amount of rep could eventually grow faster on X die. And in which case, using your percentage from mainnet might actually be kind of unfair to the people earning on, you know, their rep on X die. Like if you imagine them diverging, right, in the future. True. So, so, so I, I would, like, so, I, I mean, I'm not saying what Milan did, like, Violet did is, is, um, that's totally reasonable, but I think maybe we should set the standard that it's just the rep number. Yeah. Oh, the actual number of rep. So my like Violet, I'm looking right now. He has fifteen thousand two hundred ninety six rep point one rep, which is one percent of overall rep. This is on mainnet, and then he requested eight thousand. 200 and like 50 rep on X die because that represents 1% there. So, um, but when we map them out, we actually used the numbers on mainnet and applied them to um, X die. Um, so, yeah, I would guess anyone that's like mapping it out should um, basically like make your X die rep amount correspond to your mainnet rep amount. So, for some people, this is like, like mine, it's a little confusing because I got mapped um, several months ago, but I've gotten a lot of, um, I've gotten rep awards since then that are not recognized on there. So I guess like if I was going to make a contribution to equalize them, I would just say award me the difference in rep between my main net rep and my X die rep. Yeah. And I think that would be the, we should have that the standard going forward, which will like, you know, yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense and it also naturally uh inflates away um like the people that are no longer active especially on x die network so people that didn't map their rep and then people that don't do anything anymore they'll they'll just get a lower uh they'll have a much lower they'll have a lower percentage on x die 
DXDAO than they would on mainnet DXDAO. Yeah, and I think that is desirable because then yeah. it's easier to do absolute majority. It would be great to actually see proposals starting by absolute majority. And I feel like that should be achievable on XTI because the gas yeah. costs are lower, people have bigger percentages. Um, I mean, and then hopefully we actually, you know, it's a little less decentralized from a percentage standpoint. Like, you know, people have yeah. bigger chunks. But I mean, in reality, if the other people are inactive, it's not really that different. And then hopefully over time, you know, through activity on XTIDE, that does become more decentralized. Yeah, um, that's what I was proposing this morning, like, <clears throat> get, so there's a signal proposal, which I think Chris is gonna get to for DX Ventures, that's on XTIDE. Like, theoretically, it'd be amazing if 30 people, like anyone that's been active voting in the last three months, all voted on the proposal just to see if we could do it. That would be like, that would be more than 50%, I think, um, on XDI, I, I hopefully. But especially if we top everyone up to equal their number of rep on XDI, then, then definitely for sure that would happen. So, so I think like a simple rule, because it could get a little bit complicated on the accounting once people start earning like separate rep on the bases right like so you imagine like right now it's not really the case because there's not that much happening but i, I imagine in the future for successful people will be earning things specifically on x die for something they did on x die right um and so i think maybe a simple rule to avoid like confusion in the future is just that if you have x like absolute number rep on mainnet you can move your base rep up to that number um but not like but you can't request like i think what we want to probably avoid because you can imagine like okay i say i have a thousand rep on mainnet and i go and i earn 500 x die rep doing something on x die like i could now i could maybe be like oh i want my thousand mainnet rep in addition to the 500 like i don't know i think we should avoid the complexity of that and just kind of have like a simple um like you can always get like at least your mainnet rep. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? Like we just have like this simple one way. Yeah. Like you, you can, can you... sync your mainnet rep up to that. But if you start earning beyond that on XDI, then like that's like whatever, right? Like they should diverge. Um, um, I have another question regarding this. Um, and many new workers, they only have rep on XDI. They don't have it on mainnet. And then if we do a new tokenomics, um, uh, how we how do we do that? Because in a way, we should have one source of truth. So. Yeah. So the so as Chris as Chris did, I, um, he's reporting that he earned he should be earning 0.166 uh, mainnet rep, right? And so those are records that are in worker proposals on XDI, and there has to be once per quarter or once per six months, probably once per quarter, a top up of all workers mainnet rep in order to to uh, make the make their mainnet rep whole because mainnet rep is still the truth, right? Okay. So so yeah, I mean, I think I think there there is not a single source of truth. There's going to be divergence of um, the the bases rep accounting versus the mainnet. But there are certain things that we want to have earn mainnet rep, um, like worker proposals, right? So that uh, we're just kind of doing the worker proposals but, on X yeah, But the then we, we, we will need that people do for worker proposals and they, they use separate address. So oh, it's, I think it's quite complicated anyway, because you say that people work on XDI and then they get XDI rep, but they're, they're not. They don't have the same. So if we're going to change the tokenomics and government's point two, then uh, it's it's strange. So it's less worth then, or yeah, it's just very complicated in a way. Mm -hmm. I think you know that's also the, the the way. Yeah, if you think about chain, if you go going to chain, fork a chain, right now Ethereum or something like this. If you if you split it, then you have this exactly the same problem because you have the same infrastructure. You have people talking, and then after some time, it diverges, and then 
It's yeah, very so, so I think it's, it, the, as I understand it, we've discussed this a little bit before, <clears throat> is that they are going to diverge, right? And we're not going to be worrying about trying to make them the same. They're naturally going to diverge. The only thing we're, we're kind of updating mainnet with here is worker proposal rep. And you can think of it as like, what we really should be doing is the proposals on mainnet, but we want to save the gas. So yes, we're going to yeah. wait and just do it once a quarter, basically, and let people do their pay on XDAI, right? So, so I mean, it's not really syncing with XDAI per se. It's more like we're moving worker proposal rep disbursements to once a quarter in order to save. Gas. Yeah, this this, yeah. this makes a lot of sense, but yeah, <clears throat> it's how it is. It just adds a lot of complexity in a way because people then need to. Yeah, you have to after calculate how many. Uh, yeah, in absolute terms, how many rep you get on XDAI, but based on mainnet, as I yeah, understand. Yeah, where it does get a little, yeah. I mean, we're jumping through yeah. hoops here basically because of gas costs, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe yeah, I, I know the reasons. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just, it's yeah. just yeah. crazy how much complexity it adds at the end. It is kind of. Well, so one thing yeah. maybe we should sort out, right, is if people are doing their worker proposals on XDAI to get paid, they're getting paid regularly yes. on XDAI, right? Like once a month, once every two weeks, whatever. Um, but they're not. They're going. They can note the amount of rep they've earned in those proposals. But it does get a little confusing with the percent, right? Because yes, percentages yeah, change that's, that's, over time. Yes, so I think yes. we should just clarify, you know, when you're actually like clocking an absolute amount of rep for you. Yeah, I, I, just, I think we we need like a, a guide who is quite clear on this how how to do it. That you know, there's a lot of. Comp- Complexity anyway in this proposal stuff, and this adds just another layer. And maybe uh, it's a higher uh, yeah, Chris, HR thing, you know, in a way. Chris Chris laid that out in his XDI proposal, where he actually wrote the percentage times the total current mainnet rep, and and came up with a hard number of mainnet rep that is included. But I don't. There's like a lot of people that are probably owed rep from the past, like Martin, I think. Um, and yes. I don't know if we have records of total rep at do. Is there like a can you look up how much rep there was in DXDAO like three months ago? Is that possible? I think yes. Yeah. I would probably be. I think it's technically possible, but maybe a little bit difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, also really difficult because the amount of rep changes based upon voting. I think Etherscan has like a function where you can look at all the. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's so difficult. depending on when you vote, like this doesn't. I think we've people have conditioned themselves to not do this, but if you vote before something is boosted a percentage of your rep is actually like locked up and that actually changes the total amount of rep. So you may actually not, when you're looking at the number of rep that people have, it may not actually be the real amount of rep because some of their rep may be locked into um, pr- proposals that they voted on or, and some of it just may not be like, it could be just sitting there waiting to be redeemed too because they haven't. Um, wait, I'm just saying it is the actual value. What, what do you mean? The, the value that you see on Alchemy, is that the value that we are talking about? Yeah, what I'm saying is that the value on Alchemy does not include the rep that you haven't redeemed and that you have locked up in other proposals. No, yeah, I think it, it okay. includes it. Uh, it doesn't change because it's already minted. Uh, I'm double, let's double check that because I think... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. We should go back and check. Well, that. Okay, because I, I, I just run the script to to get the total reputation of mainnet, and I get exactly the same value seen at the mint uh, events from mainnet from my script. So I but, think I think we are taking. The but individual person, no, an, an individual person, your rep on a on a on a basis goes lower, moves around. Yeah, this what I'm saying. It's not a UI issue. This is actually how rep works, right? Like it's it gets de- reduced, or like if it's not redeemed, it's not added to your actual a rep score. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I completely agree that this is confusing. As we can see, it's like because rep is confusing. Like at the not even <laughs> <Based> UI. <laughs> 
the base the base level is confusing. Um, I think there are a couple things that we're we're thinking of here. Um, so one, really three things, I think, just to kind of sum it up here. One, we need to make sure every mainnet rep address mainnet rep has the same amount of rep on other bases that we have. If you have mainnet rep, you should have rep on any other um, DX style base and that is something that we, we could have. So that's the first it's like thing. A, it's like a worldwide visa for me. Yeah, yeah, something, yeah. It's kind of like a, I don't know who the best uh, passport to have. Um, but, uh, and then the second is we need to have a once a quarter reconciliation. I think it needs to be once a quarter. Uh, and we should aim to do that in like a month or two, I guess, for the first one, maybe for, for April, that um, gives the rep rewards that we're not giving um, through worker proposals and reconciles them. And that yeah. has to be, we put a lot of thought into, but we just like, we can't get, a, we can't get away from. And I think maybe to reduce confusion, it's not really a reconciliation with XI. It's simply like doing the worker proposal. Yeah. 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 Um, and then just the, the third thing um, I'm going to create a, I think it's a spreadsheet. We just need a spreadsheet. That's like um, how much, like what's my worker level commitment and how much rep am I getting? And you could even like, cause I actually did this when I think Zet was calculating his rep in the past. And I just like ballpark some fig, you know, I just did like, well, we had like about this much rep at this time multiplied out. Um, so we should be able to just calculate for people. So based I think, off what the inputs are like yeah. their, their rep rewards and they can just paste that on the bottom of every proposal. So I think what, what we could do to, to like, kind of help with the accounting and confusion here is change it from a percentage to a fixed amount and then update that periodically uh the percentage the percentage is important because as it's grow, important because the rep changes right so you want to have that amount changing over time um but it's it causes a lot of like accounting like weirdness, right? Because then it actually matters like when you're doing the percentage, like, you know, like when you make your proposals, you get this yep. problem now, if you didn't do it in the past, then what are you actually owed? Like, but, but Chris, like Chris solved that problem exactly in his XDI worker proposal. He just put the actual amount based on the current. If everyone does that, it's easy going forward for worker proposals. The only thing is we need to, like Martin always didn't do his rep two months ago. We just need to have an estimate or look up how much total rep there was at that point. So the past ones, we can do some calculations. But as long as you do what Chris did going forward, and you put when you, you do your proposal, you have to put this in your in your XI proposal. You have to put a rep amount. And as long as you just calculate percentage times main net rep at that time, you'll have a record of it. I think, right? Yeah, that works. I'm just kind of questioning the percentage as the like mode of, of tracking this. It would just be simpler, I think, if we just had a number. Yeah, but then you have to change yeah, it. You can change it every. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting idea, but because, like because it is confusing. Um, but then we do have to change it, and then put someone puts the wrong number. I'm not. I'm not opposed to it, but it just. Yeah. The percentage um, you don't ever have to change. All you have to do is when you do your proposal, yeah. look at the amount of. Made that rep. Yeah, I mean that's the beauty of the percentage, and I think why we have it. I'm just saying it, it comes with other headaches, though, right? Like, like what is it actually? <laughs> or like, are people technically owed more rep because a bunch of people didn't request rep already, and so the rep should be higher? Like, I don't know. It gets weird, right? Like, yeah, um, I think so. Just Martin, I, I want to like make sure that we can we have some clarity in the short term. We can kind of like get make sure people are are getting through this process now and then maybe we can figure out like how to make some of these adjustments on, on that. I think I really want to make sure that we get a like a, a spreadsheet that does like a calculator of this. Um, but like what are in terms of like what we can do um, right now uh, to make to make it easier um, what 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 are you what are you thinking or any, anyone else that's like you know about to submit the worker proposal or is thinking about these things? Um, outside of the rep award, um, what else, what, what should we be thinking about? The uh, main, main thing for me would be to have 
uh, Weth on XDI, but last time I checked, it wasn't there. Maybe maybe it's added now. So that's a good uh, point, actually. Um, the two things on that are one: this is part of the having a swapper Weth pool will help with that, and then two, um, I want to do another XDI authors uh, another funding of XDI um, in the next like day or two, and I think we should have uh, Weth in there. For that, just so that the XDI base has has some some width. Cool. Are we uh, for vesting DXD? Is the idea to also move vesting DXD to XDI? Well, I, if, if we had wait. if we had DXD um, XDXD or in in XDX DAO, and 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 Zeppelin uh, vesting contracts were on XDI. It would be super cheap and easy, but we I thought we weren't doing that because we were um, waiting for the Block Rocket new. So that was the other thing I was going to mention. Is that Block Rocket is still working. I actually have a call with them tomorrow, and and so we in the like I said, I think there's still even on XDI, there's still some like UX improvements we can get from this. Right, basically save people the calculations or whatever and reduce it to like clicking a button on the on the payroll interface um but immediately like if we had the zeppelin contract vesting contracts on x dive people could and we had some right, exactly. yeah but, i mean we yeah is there any reason not to do that like the only reason why? would be like do you want your locked up dxd like on x die for like two years and what happened if something happened to XDI? It's safer to have it on mainnet. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, like another idea would be to um, like change the duration of, or like the amount, like basically the DXDAO is kind of committing um, six months of vested DXD upfront, but can always like take it back, right? So. Yeah, I, I think like DXD should be considered. I think we should wait for Block Rocket and what they're producing if that's an easier system. I think like, yeah, and I think we want to make sure people can get paid cheaply. And I think like the ETH, WETH, DAI payment is the most uh, important thing. And we want to make sure that we at least have like a system that people are comfortable with doing that and then adding so, things on top of that. I think one really important thing is that we're using XDAI as a tool like DXDAO is is taking a measured approach of how much money it's going to put on XDAI and it could remove it at any time. And workers can get paid on XDAI and like a day later, you can move it to mainnet if you don't want to have money locked up yourself on XDAI. Because like, what if something happened to XDAI? But if you start locking up two-year vesting based on XDAI contracts, that you don't have a choice anymore as a, as a worker. I think it's better to keep anything long-term that you can't immediately move back across a bridge, even though something could happen. I think you anything longer term, I think you want to keep on uh, a mainnet, even at a higher cost. And the payroll SIP system that Block Rocket is working on will help a lot with that because then we don't have to deploy um, a new vesting contract for every pay period. Yeah, awesome. That saves a lot of gas, actually. Right? I think that's quite a bit. Cool. Um, we'll keep moving along. Sky, do you want to, the XDI proposal for DX Ventures, do you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. So it's it's really just, uh, well, we first proposed the idea three weeks ago. We um, had some discussion. We've had a lot of discussion around potential investments. Um, we also were waiting for the XDI authorization so that we could do this like a formal proposal, signal proposal for DX Ventures on XDI and it would and it would count as the voice of DX DAO. Uh, so that's live on there. It would be awesome if everyone could vote on it if you have XDI rep. Uh, and then the idea would be if this is approved, uh, it didn't have any actual investments in this, but the idea would be to kind of write a 
read a post and announced this to the world, which even though people could come and see this anyway, right? But and ideally also include one or maybe two initial investments as part of the announcement and launch of it. And there's a there's a handful of uh, projects we're talking about, but at the same time, it could take more than like a couple weeks to like get those deals done. So we need to. I think each investment, the, I think the process, which I outlined in there at the end, which is what we've learned over the last couple of weeks, is that we're going to have like an opportunity to invest in a project. Let's say Opolis, for example. We want to do a proposal to see whether or not DXDAO community would, is, would like to approve that type of an investment, like in general. And then in order to do like an on chain, contract in quotes investment into it which could be giving money to that project with with a basically a promise from the project to to give tokens at some point in return or potentially have equity in that investment in that project i i think the best way would to do an online an on-chain contract with with a third party is for that third party with our help to actually submit the on-chain proposal to DXDAO with the terms of the agreement of the deal and then DXDAO would approve it and and vote on it and then that is kind of a, as much of a binding contract as DXDAO has done in the past and is comfortable with and so there's you could argue there's a little bit of trust like because there's not a there's no legal entity contract but there's this on Line, there's this on-chain contract through our proposal system between the two parties and if we make it public there's also a lot of reputation at risk so once that is agreed and we give a fifty thousand dollar money or however it's structured to investment to that project if a year from now and actually pulp and i were talking about uh tammy and i were talking about like potentially putting a, an arbitration clause, maybe using Kleros in the actual terms of that of that proposal as well. So that like six months from now when the tokens exist and they're supposed to deliver tokens to DXDAO, like there is public reputation that if they don't do and they don't perform on their end, like it would hurt their reputation. And there's a arbitrator clause as well. So that's like the overall process of how i think these things would work and the only way to to learn is to like do one we need to like do one once we have this approved we need to just do the first one and see how it goes but there is a little bit of trust in these things because it's just an on-chain contract agreement between two parties but dx has been doing that for now over a year and it, it seems to work right it's a new way of doing business deals i guess yeah, that's all. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think to the extent yeah, possible. That... Oh, sorry, Tammy, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think this is a really uh, cool opportunity. I was telling Sky and others for us to kind of even uh, beyond this, if there are any other at any other time, some on chain treasuries or something like that, where we could try to even do something more smart contract related and have it actually built into like the parameters of the agreement built into a smart contract. There's like a lot of area for exploration here uh, in the future. So where it's not just in writing um, when it comes to some of the uh, requirements of any agreement that we have with another DAO, for example. So um, though we're gonna start off with more of just like a written contract, it could be interesting to see uh, how this, this grows in the future, that's all. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, actually, that, you know, we could try to minimize the trust to the extent possible with you know, doing stuff on chain or, you know, like an escrow contract, or if they already have a token, then you, you get that outright, et cetera. And then, then whatever we can't do, we, we use agreements. There was some talk, too, about, uh, I think, Tammy, you were mentioning this, right, like arbitration or agreeing to a, a certain kind of on-chain court upfront might be part of that as well. Yeah, I, 
I, I think I think Sky mentioned that. I, I was I know uh, Claros has been something we used for Omen. I'm not sure if there's any other arbitrators that we would be interested in working with, but it is kind of fun to think of the idea that you know it's all within the Ethereum world. So I like that. And that's and I guess I understand that that's that arbitration clause is something that's very very common in any term sheet investment agreement uh like in the real world in the or world. any or any contract in the real world yeah, yeah. like this will be arbitrated in these yeah. courts and this jurisdiction. So coming up with that language and okay like is the project that we're working with going to agree to let Claros decide something like that's that may be the biggest obstacle but you know it's yeah I luckily this is this, especially if they're dealing with a if they're dealing with VC financing as well, which it seems like a lot of the um, projects we've so far talked to are, th this is just very normal for, um, especially for the person, the entity giving the money, they usually, not always, but they usually dictate the forum. That means even like, you know, of course for traditional courts, that would be the, you know, if, if, if it's in California state court or federal court in New York, whatever. Um, and if it's gonna be arbitration, all that stuff's usually dictated by the, um, uh, financier. The beauty of Claros is you don't have to fly to California for the case. Yeah, the only one obstacle which we will see if if we encounter this, and hopefully the projects that are excited to take DXDAO, you know, partnership investment, um, would be like if a VC is also investing, like for example, Radical, a VC might be like, I don't like, I don't want my portfolio company to take that type of non-legal non-real world legal agreement with some weird arbitration like and they projects may get pushed back from vcs but we'll only know until we try right it's if i'm a vc right, i'm well, skeptical of this right well right but usually we won't be contracting with the other the other vc it's really just for the money that we the investment, you know, resources or, you know, personnel resources, whatever it is that we give to uh, the, the startup. And um, it's just usually in between us. The main thing is like, usually the question is if there's some sort of order of operations regarding the um, return on investment. So if there's a certain VC before us and things like that, but um, uh, technically, we are considered a, a general partnership, I would say, in a traditional court. So it's not that there's no legal entity. It's just that we're like a de facto legal entity, meaning we're not registered anywhere. Um, so it, it's a little bit, it's not completely outlandish to think that, you know, you know, we're, we're, we can be like represented in a contract for some sort of, uh, yeah, it's really just about the other side agreeing to it. And that's it, if they want the, the investment. Cool. And I liked just in Sky's proposal, the things I liked about it is kind of like the next step. It was like kind of, you know, imagining how there will need to be two proposals and how things will flow. I think it's a good um, habit to get into of like um, predicting or kind of foreshadowing future proposals or, or actions. Cool. Anything else? Um, I know we're running out on time. I wanted to just talk about the buyback. Um, i give an update on the buyback. Tammy has been working on some things here. And so Tammy, I don't know if you want to uh, kick off with, like, there's a couple different documents and things we're trying to do to get ready for this. And so it basically would be some type of proposal um, that lays out a couple different things um, before getting into the actual like technical um, proposal to actually buy it. So Tammy, um, want to give an update of where we're at? Yeah, you know, I thought about sharing my screen, but it's just a lot of written stuff. And I don't think it's going to process very well uh, at this point. So I will share the documents on our main key base before we post them on Dow Talk. But uh, the main points are that we're going to be uh, starting a token buyback program. Uh, 
soon once we know that the tech's ready. Um, and I, th I think that the announcement will happen one week on, you know, they'll be on Dow Talk for just the normal process we do for all of our proposals, saying, hey, we're going to put this proposal up on chain for a token buyback program. We're buying approximately uh, $1 million uh, in DAI, uh, and it's going to be over a six month period. Uh, the the uh, announcement just walks through uh, all the discussions that we've had regarding the need for the buyback, why we think uh, it's a good time to do the buyback, and why we think we have ample treasury resources and we're in a good financial position to do the buyback. Um, yeah, so I'll I can actually put that in uh, Keybase or something like that very soon. Uh, there's two. There's really just technical questions though that um, I've run into. Um, that I've talked with Chris about, and I think some of them actually were addressed at the developers call earlier this week. But uh, one thing I do want to know is what exchanges um, we're going to be uh, buying DXD from. Is it just going to be Swapper? Is it going to be Uniswap, Swapper, SushiSwap? Uh, I would like to list that in the announcement. Uh, so once we know that, that would be great. What else? Yeah, that's that's really the main thing. Um, that's the big detail that I'm missing. Um, I think everything was explained with how the price um, works as far as determining the price through the price oracle. Uh, and then uh, I think, Chris, did you have any other questions? I know we, we kind of discussed how the um, our goal of trying to do an average daily trading volume of about 25% um, uh, of the circulating supply of, of being traded of DXD um, a day for the the course of the buyback program, which we said was probably fifty thousand dollars in die between uh, kind of more the trusted exchanges, which of course Swapper, Uniswap, um, Sushi Swap, Balancer. But are those going to be the exchanges that you know we're actually going to be using? Really makes that number somewhat fluctuate. So it's, it's an, I, I'm wondering if the real is actually going to be able to technically work that way. So those are really the two questions and just really, we have all the documents ready. It's just a matter of um, just meeting equally with the tech and getting the proposal passed and, and we're good to go. So what has been developed so far is a Gnosis protocol relayer, which would put a limit order in on Gnosis protocol. Um, so that would not enable like direct buys from on chain liquidity pools, but presumably people would you know, trade into it. Um, so we could stick with that if people feel like um, that's not sufficient. I mean, I think we could probably develop another one which does the trades via either one inch or, or the individual exchanges specifically. There is a lot of DXD in Meso, or I guess like Gnosis protocol that's deposited. I think there's like 800 DXD that's that's there. So, um, I mean, I think it would be cool to use uh, or products dog food is a little bit. And so like, I, I'm definitely leaning towards like the Gnosis protocol component. Um, but I definitely understand that it like one inch probably would, you know, provide like a quick execution. Um, but I think for this, like it since especially since it's a limit order, you can just like put it out there and um, like the market can come and get it. It's not about like execute, like really transacting. Yeah, I mean, maybe it makes sense to back up a second, like, and just say, like, would you rather have this be a limit order or a market buy? Right. But then, um, sorry, maybe another thing is uh, we don't know how long the Gnosis is running Mesa, because yeah, if we change the the brand, then there's no interface, or so it's an old interface, and they have run uh, they have running costs for the matching of Mesa, the old Mesa. And I don't know how long they will support it. So how so long the solver, asked, the solver will, you know, how long the solver will run? Not you can withdraw the token, but yeah, you have information. I asked this. Martin Köppelmann and he said, yeah. until GPV2 is not out in public, GPV1 is supported. Okay. 
but like based on our experience uh it it is smart to be in touch with them just because uh we need to tell them that the solver needs to work once the limit order reaches on chain yeah it's just if we try to write it down now in a paper and we say we will buy it back on on the gnosis and then gnosis not running after four months they stop it running then yeah we change it it's no problem yeah it's whatever you think will be the the smoothest um to start off with i you can all read i think it takes two or three minutes to read through the announcement uh but i do have you know something in there of course saying that if something changes we will have to adjust accordingly so that would be an example of that <laughs> So regardless of exchanges, do you guys or Tammy, Chris, do, you, do people think that it should be a limit order or should it be a market order, market money? I mean, I think from like a process perspective, it's easier if it's a limit order because it's like we are putting in this order like come and take and leave it. And we are like agreeing and voting on that. And we're like putting it out there. Um, but that, I don't know if we like know what that order should be and like whether that'll like eat it, eat, eat everything up or like how that will um, work. But I like imagine we need to have some bounds on it initially, like in using the relayer. So that would kind of provide a little bit of a um, limit order, but yeah. Yeah, definitely limit order because it's like we are on the safe side. Um, Temi, I think like the way we are going to approach it is anyway like, okay, we set aside one mil USD and like we will create those limit orders according like market conditions. Do I understand it correct? Yes. Like I think um, yeah. by using just GPV1, yeah. it's just like a way safer and calmer process of just like buying back our stuff over a longer period of in a way it, it's a, yeah, that's, be a that's perfect use right. case for the easy auction algorithm in a way but yeah it's not ready <laughs> maybe but maybe yeah because you know we just make an auction with the with the die and then you say we, are, we accept um take stay for it and then people will Bit TXT for the die, and then you be yeah, like get the market we'll price. Push the price way up. So, right. one one so other option. The limit order is a little bit more. Yeah, but it's just that it it would also be a use case for the easy auction algorithm in a way, if you just do it the other way, because it it should then get to the market price. People will buy TXT on the market, and then sell it to uh, against the die but as the product is not ready so this is not an option one other option is to empower the multi-sig to like transact the buyback like and there's a lot of flexibility there because then you you can you can act when the time is right you can do different things you can i think leave limit orders you can use one inch you could just do clips of buy of buying back i mean it's an, it's an option if if the other thing's too difficult or something doesn't work yeah if a, let's first explore doing it as automated as possible um within a set area of parameters because that's what I, I i do like that element um of how we can do it and then if for some reason, there's some technicality that won't work for a limit order. Uh, that that's an option, but I I don't consider it to be ideal. Yeah, like well, I think when when these buybacks happen in the in the corporate world, financial world, like the company is hiring an investment bank to to execute the buyback within a outlined structure, right? It's like they don't do it every day at 9 a.m. like once a week or something it, like there's a there's a team that's hired to execute the buyback and there's some strategy involved in that as well 
but it's within parameters that are outlined and set by the company and its shareholders, right? That's right. And usually that's the thing is it gets me into these other areas of complication that I was kind of happy to avoid, which is like, then the multi-sig almost feels like a broker. And then it's these questions that you, when you take out the human involvement, I don't have, we don't have to deal with because we have it programmed into our smart contract, which is what I liked about yeah. it. Yeah, that's ideal. Yeah. I think it makes sense to stay the course there. Yeah, I think this is one of those examples where like the constraints are actually like making us build something that we like have to use that's better. Um, so I'm just hearing that the the we want to do a limit order, and so if we're going to do a limit order, then we're gonna that's basically using um, Gnosis protocol. Um, I did just briefly want to I, I did like some brief calculations on like what this would look like um, here. So if we were doing 50K clips, um, and so here what I have is like, this is the current prices here. Um, I have, I built in a, basically a 0 0.006 um, like stair escalator increase for each 50K. Oh, don't see the screen. Oh. Um, I can see it. Never mind then. It's, it's, it's just um, me then. That's what I was asking. It's okay. Keep going. Um, yeah. Get it from you so, later. <laughs> and so the, basically you can see here, like if we bought 50K of this, that would be 254 DXD. And then here it's implying that like, uh, or I think it actually starts here, that each day it would go up by like 0. 0.006. That that's some way counting for the new DXD that's off, the DXD that's off the market. Right, and you could see here that this would be a million dollars um, here, and that would get us a lot of DXD, three thousand three hundred and four, um, and that would assume like a price of a DXD price of like four oh seven four hundred and seven dollars, still using today's ETH prices, um, but really like the the. Since DXD, since DXD has so much ETH, really like the key factor is the DXD ETH price. And so this would like assume that that would rise to 0.253. Um, but you can still see here that this is still a lot of DXD. Um, this would be 3% of the ETH in the treasury and then 6.7% of the current DXD circulating supply, which is like 49 thousand or or something um so i think this could actually look a little high and i don't know if we would like end up getting to this um and who knows what the market would do if this would is like how it would react uh in different ways um but i think we want to have some idea of what we're doing just so we um can adjust or have a plan yeah i think you're not taking into consideration uh like the front running that's going to happen probably right Yes, do you like, do you have a way of? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's guessing. The, my, my other question would be what, like, we're going to do a limit order. Have we determined where we set the limit order at? Well, that's, yeah, that was a conversation. Is it Gnosis protocol that we were just having? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry, sorry. No, I meant like the price uh, of the limit order. Yeah, I mean, so in this, um, in this one, this is what I'm like, we do this every day. Um, we would, the, the two ways we have it is the relayer itself could use the time weighted average price of the Uniswap and balancer, or I guess just the Uniswap pool. Um, and so we could use that to place the limit order. Um, alternatively, we could, uh, and then that would, like, you could use that, that time weighted average price, but then set upper and lower bounds on what that could be. Alternatively, uh, we could set the price itself. In, in the oh. Chris, Chris, like buyback gets approved, buyback starts, DXD price goes to 800. What do you do on day two? Right. Like the, the, these, these orders have to be dynamic. It, like, okay, we're going to still buy back, but it's just going to be a higher price. So we're going to get less DXD, but we're still going to spend the plan is still to spend a million dollars of uh, die buying back DXD, correct? Exactly. That's part of it. And also, uh, 
well, what I'm hoping, okay, so this is another question I have. We can, we should, you know, try to randomize this as much as possible that, that we can, because six months, we actually, to do this, we don't need every day of six months in order to do the buyback. I think it's 20 days or something like that for 50,000 um, guy a day. Uh, so, I mean, obviously someone can figure it out if they want. Uh, aside from that though, just lost my train of thought. There was one other thing. Eh, I'll think of it and get back to you guys. Yeah, like, like let's say even three days in, DXD goes to 1,200. Like, is there, a, is there some price at which the program is going to pause? Yeah, so to, to like back up, if we say we want to buy a million dollars of TXT, that sounds basically like a market order, right? If there's no stipulation as to like at which price we want to buy that million dollars worth. Yes. Okay. That was what, that was part of the, the thought process that I lost. Uh, so we need, yeah, if we can, we do need to, I thought the Oracle had something in it where it, it, it created bounds based on the uh, vault, like the, the price, the average price from other markets. Um, so that does, it does to create kind of a range. I mean, we could check, right? Like you could say, I mean, Mechanically, we could put in a limit order at the current price or the current price plus whatever or minus whatever. Uh, but there's, if you put in a limit order, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to fulfill it, right? Like the price could move. Um, yeah, but actually, that's that actually is kind of nice because we, like I said, it could take twenty, you know, twenty if we twenty days, six month period. There is a bit of some some level of controlling controlling the space, and then we always adjust weekly based on what the you know the trading volume is, the amount we're going to be buying, um, and also the price. So it doesn't need to be set in stone for forever in the future, but it just kind of responds incrementally to what the market is doing. Does that does that make sense, or is that sounding too complex? I mean, I think that's fine, but are we, wouldn't we need to specify how to respond to the market? Like, um... yeah, you, you you're gonna you're gonna say you're gonna want to say, DX Dow thinks DXD is cheap. Um, it has it's implementing this buyback plan to buy up to a mil up to a million dollars of DXD over the next six months, and like. Not, not much more detail than that. Maybe maybe something about like once every cut, no more than twice a week or something like that of clips of X. But at, at there there should be there internally or in the buyback maybe just internally maybe not written down. There should be like at some price like eight hundred dollars per DXD. Like the program may pause right. So like the limit is not on like each specific order, which can be executed at market order or a limit order at the time. But there should be, at some point, does DXDAO not think ETH is cheap or DXD is cheap anymore? And what, what is that price? Right, so the conversation has been uh, looking at the our market cap book value for you know what we consider under, but we could all, you know, we're, we are significantly under that amount. So we could consider it some sort of percent of market cap or book value. Um, yeah. And again, for the relay, for, for the actual market price, it like, like with, I, I think this is just more my sense than, oh, this is how it should be done. But it's for the average daily trading volume, it's usually an average, each week's average of average daily trading volume. You take those four, the past four weeks, and you you add those together. And, you know that's that average of the past month is how you get to your usual average daily trading volume. That's the, the calculation you get there. the The price needs to be at least dependent on the previous selling day, as to where the price was. So we, you know, you can kind of cap it at a certain amount. That's not, you know, it needs to be around that as far as like the price we're willing to sell at, or not sell. Sorry, buy. Yeah. I mean, I think it is incredibly difficult to predict how the market will react to this. Like, this is what's really like the trouble with this is like, how do we provide, how do we like establish some system of forward looking guidance that accounts for potential 
changes in the market that you know the actions we're taking are going to influence future market actions. So it's really, really hard to do that. Um, I think we should be thinking about this in terms of the DXD ETH, um, the DXD ETH um, price, partially because like DXD could go to 800, but that could be because ETH goes to like 3000 or 4000 or something, right? And I think that would that would change um, the circumstance. I think Tammy's point about the, the book value would carry here because then the um, you're only looking at uh, that that accounts for the ETH value in the the treasury. What if we just committed to like buying 50k of DXD at a like DXD to ETH price that just goes incrementally up by like 0. 0.005. So right now it's like 0. 0.12 DXD per ETH and we just said we're going to like buy 50k at 0. 0.125 DXD ETH, and then in like two weeks, we're gonna buy it at, we're gonna buy 50K USD uh, at 0.13 DXD ETH, and then like the next week later, we do 0.135 ETH, uh, and we just like commit to that for a certain amount of time. Maybe like, I don't know, like a month or something. We, we don't really need to do that is the thing like we can just commit to like the book value like we could we could do that if that if that's what people well want that's to do, clear because i think what we, we haven't had anything yeah. laid out right now that's like this is this this is like what orders we're going to place we're just kind of talking about it so i'm saying like can we put out specific orders that we're going and signal specific orders that we're going to execute on over like a month time period and i think the easiest way to do that is having like committing to a dxd eth price and i think that that will obviously be like front runnable but it will also like maintain the um it'll it'll prevent it from being like exploited because it's like no we're only going to buy like at 0.14 eth this week right or something like that or i guess what other ways can we like signal the orders we want I think another way we could frame this, and I think it was one of the ways we had discussed it before, is if the goal here is basically to establish some kind of a floor on the price, like put a hand under the market price, we can say the, I mean, with all the stuff that Tammy's already got in there, it's like DXL will buy, market buy up to a thousand, sorry, up to a million dollars worth of DXT um, as long as the price is below, you know, X ETH. DXD price, like, or and you, you could relate it to the treasury and say, you know, if it's below, you know, 30% of the treasury, we do this buy at 50K clips um, up to a million dollars. I think that's exactly right. what we should do. Like, I think that's, yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, I mean, that's our justification, or partial, it's part of it, aside from the swapper needs and all of that. But uh, the reason why we're buying it right now is it's, it's a good deal. So when it becomes not a good deal, we need to, you know, change our uh, decision making process. So up to thirty percent is fine. Um, I tried to share my screen with you guys because I was going to just show you the document that I have written, and it basically encompasses everything we've said. And it really does give us, which is so normal, to give us complete wiggle room to to stop this at any time if something outside of what we wanted to happen with, you know, the idea of doing the buyback doesn't work. You know, like we can all come to a consensus to 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 you know, put another proposal forward saying, hey, um, you know, there's just been way too much front running or whatever the problem is, and we, we can close the program down until we, we figure out um, uh, what to do about it to fix it. Yeah, and I think as long as you have, the, yeah, as long as you have that threshold, okay. right, front running is not a problem because it will push us up to that threshold faster, right? Like, and, and then and it's kind of the point, so. Um, yeah. I think that should do it. I mean, okay, basically, so you, you 30, just say. The real question is thirty yeah. percent. Yeah, you want. Somebody? So the real questions are like, what are that threshold, and what is the maximum amount yeah. we're willing to spend? So then we're doing market buys then. The, right? Yeah, and then you also specify the the clips, the rate at which you're doing it, right? Like, how big is that market buy? Um, so it's market buy. We're doing market buys. The amount in dollars. And we will do these on a consistent basis until up to a million dollars, um, in as long as D 
TXT ETH is at a certain price, below a certain price. And, or, I mean, we could make that DXT ETH definition about book value. So maybe, so maybe the market reacts by saying, oh, well, this is going to happen, so we'll buy it up to that rate. Anyways, and and DXT doesn't even have to spend the full million, right, if, it, if the market moves ahead. Um, and if it yeah, doesn't, right. then you buy the back right. to the DXT and take it off the market. So. And then if yeah. the price goes below, we can reinitiate the program again, pretty much, because it's a good deal to buy back at that point. For us but um ideally the you know yeah i mean you, you could just have a standing <laughs> a standing program or a whatever like signal proposal that sets this out like you know in perpetuity that like up to this amount will be spent if it ever okay. goes below this ratio and then um, so yeah i mean I, just the, the price right, floor does value. does make me a little worried um I'm not like just as like an instinctual thing. Um, yeah, if we set it low enough, I mean, the treasury could literally buy back the entire circulating supply, which is not going to happen. Like this is not right, going right. to happen. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it's this is algorithmic. It's like what we're describing here, and I think that's like fine. But I think I'd rather have like an algorithmic solution. Then, um, yeah, and, and I think that's what this does. It gives us a nice, like, simple parameter that's, you know, very easy to convey to the community, and then it gives us a way to implement it. I think in this case, though, if we what we actually do want to do is, is, is market buys, is what we probably should do is develop a one-inch relayer, which is probably going to be useful anyways because Gnosis Protocol is um, going on a commission at some point. Or we use the the easy auction um, when it's ready. No LBPs. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so this this needs to be, well, it sounds like two things. Okay, we're not gonna be posting this next week if we have to create a new relay, right? So- Well, no, we're, I don't think- Kind of come to- I, I think we're probably not that, that's in the future. We should still try to, I guess, well, now, if we're gonna do market buys, we should do this through one inch then. Or can we still do that right. on so, Gnosis Protocol? I My point is that, you know, I can circulate the documents and they can be public, but once we post the documents as an announcement for a buyback, we wanna post it on Twitter and we wanna have everything ready to start the buyback program. Um, that, that's where, where I'm at with, with like us announcing it, you know? So either are we gonna do, I just wanna make sure we're gonna do Genosis or are we, what do we think with that? Yeah, the Genosis path we can do like right now. So I would, um, I think we should just go with it. And like, I think we should include like, if Misa is ready, then we like might switch to Misa just to like include Misa if it's ready. It's so, yeah, so Gnosis protocol, we can do limit orders and you just, to buy a market order, you basically set the limit like 10% above the market price or something. Like, and if the market jumps up, okay, it's not gonna get done, but then you need to leave another, you need to adjust it or leave another limit order. But you, you need to leave the limit order far above the market price in order to get the market Order done. Yeah, yeah, we can effectively do market orders. So. Yeah. And we would tell Gnosis to make sure it's running. <laughs> and, we the will, and we will also tell like the community that this is ha happening, like get involved in Mesa orders, right? Or something. And all its crappy experience and high gas prices. It may actually, it may actually involve, you know, arbit arbitragers or community people buying DXD off of Uniswap one inch and Sushi Swap and Swapper, and then selling it into orders on Mesa if if that is where the orders are. Like there will be, um, there will likely be arbitragers looking at this scenario, right? And the, 
it's a way to do market orders across a number of exchanges via a Mesa limit order. So it's gonna it could get kind of complex, but that's all in the background. Arbitrages will take care of it, right? If you put the yeah. order out there, it will happen. As long as, as, long as Mesa is working. <laughs> If there's money to be made and Mesa is working, yeah, it'll happen. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Par partially though, I'm, I'm not going to, I'll, I'll give you guys, I'll show you the, the doc that we have. I'll drop it actually in the governance, uh, in one of our channels. Um, and I don't know if I'll, I'm going to say these specifics unless we need to, if it, it feels absolutely necessary or confusing somehow to the community. Okay. We can, but it's just a lot of detail. Yeah, no, I think not, not saying for a, I mean, I, I think like we want to have all the great, like we're, we've discussed this a lot, but this is like complicated stuff. Um, but I'm feeling like we're getting towards a cohesive uh, thing. And I think we should be able to present all of this in a cohesive way um, to the community at once. I'm hoping that we could, yeah, and I think like we're working on on those, Tammy, and like once those are all ready, we can just do like one Dow Talk post that links to those. We, uh, okay, cool. Do we do we want to do a test Mesa DXD like one DXD like buyback on Mesa to make sure that it's possible? Is that a problem? I, I think we should follow up on like the technical details of how we're doing. Have a separate meeting just to kind of work through it, how this will. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, we could do a diagnosis protocol. It's just we should make sure we're ready and the timing and, and all that. Let me do another meeting. Okay. And Tammy, like what I was thinking of, like a, a timeline here, and this is independent of the, the technical stuff, is that we could like try to shoot for a next week have this post up and then do like a signal proposal from that post. Um, and then we could actually do an XDI, I think would be fine. Um, so that would mean maybe like two weeks from today around there, we would have a signal proposal that would like approve this plan. And then we would move over to like being able to try to like implement that um, through uh, technically and, and get another an actual proposal that executes the market order. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that we're, I want it to be some, I think we should all, this is, it's a signal proposal, but it's also an announcement. Like I know everything we do here is public, but it needs to be pretty close in time to like the technical ability to be able to, to execute. And it sounds right. like we're there. We just need to solidify a couple things. So two weeks should be fine, I think, um, as long as we're set on uh, using the Genosis uh, relayer. Um, well, actually one thing, we, we're still not totally uh, set on um, what percent of book value, but um, I'm gonna think about it a little bit more. And if anyone has any specific um, opinions or thoughts, let's talk. Yeah, and I think what we, you know the Gnosis protocol is being redeployed. So what we can do is just wait to to do the proposal for this until that's redeployed um, and working, which may it might be a couple more weeks because of the you know the requirement to have a new multi-call scheme installed. But but we could do that. Awesome. Okay, so just we'll just keep everyone in the loop on the documentation and the protocol. And uh, just to be clear, uh, we're wanting to inform the community in two weeks, or we're ready to to start working towards that in two weeks. I think that would be the earliest that we would be ready to inform. And I think it sounds like if I would read the tea leaves here, to in order to align that closer with the new relayer, we're probably looking for a signal proposal to pass and then correspond with an announcement within like three or three and a half weeks. Um, right. And then we would be able to execute on that around uh, at that around then. But I think we want to like tie all those things. I think it's what Tammy's saying. Like we want to make sure that like those things are all going through at the same time. So is there is there going to be a Dow talk 
post before the actual proposal then? Yeah. I mean, well, what I'm thinking is there's a Dow talk post of what we're discussing here. And then that leads to a signal proposal. Right. And then that goes through. And then that's what the announcement is based off of. And then separate from that, we have an actual proposal to like execute the trade. And that will happen like around the announcement or whatever. So then there will be, you know, six or seven days or whatever on that. So, so let's do this. Once the new multi-call scheme proposal gets made, I think that would be a good time to do the Dow talk post, right? Because that's going to take 16, 17 days to, to pass. And that gives like a good two weeks of discussion on the Dow talk post. And then, you know, once the new multi-call is installed, you're free to do the actual proposal, right? Yeah, but I still think it's good to have sep two separate proposals between the like trade execution and the signal proposal. Just, but yeah, um, the trade execution might actually end up being multiple proposals. But yeah, right, right, right. That's yeah, yeah, right. So basically, the language in the DAO talk post, um, you know, subject to any amendments from the community, is going to be the language in that on-chain proposed signal proposal, and then everything from there is just whatever you need to do with the protocol. But that's my understanding, and I think we're all on the same page. Yeah. So we'll work on this, okay, keep working on this, and until the the new relay or the new multi-call scheme proposal gets submitted, we'll wait to post it on Dow Talk, uh, and then that'll like kickstart the, the the process there. Yeah, I think aiming for the new multi-call scheme proposal and this Dow Talk proposal sometime next week is like a good goal, and then yeah, we'll take it from there. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, John, uh, like, uh, what is the current state of the redeploy of the multi-call? Are we planning to have, like, a split of two multi-calls? Um, we can do that, yeah. Um, for the – so to do – well, so, I mean, there's, there's a, that's another thing, right? But there's the, the Gnosis protocol relayer, there's the Swapper liquidity relayer, right? And I think we want to make sure those – Two are like ready to go and working and, and deployed, and then we do the next multi-call um, scheme. So we're already planning on testing the swapper liquidity relayer this week. I think it's actually ready to be tested. We just need those funds in the multi-sync. So I'll I'll get with Nico about what the timeline is looking like for the Gnosis protocol relayer update and how best to, to test that. I think we want to test that on X time first, but yeah. Yeah, so so but that's um, a separate. I think you want to do another multi-call scheme. That's kind of yeah. not going to stop or affect kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so like the the plan is still to like include basically everything that we have right now with like the new relayers as like a safe multi-call version, and then we can like just add a quicker one, right? With like the non-secure connections. Cool. Cool. I do feel like we had like a breakthrough at the end, so I feel like it's like worth it. Um, I feel like we're like getting agreement and have a good path forward here. Um, so maybe it's worth the extra time, but any other Thoughts, questions, concerns? I just like that we have recording over an hour now. I know, man. The lady doesn't come in and I guess they, I don't know, Jitsi upgraded past an hour. <laughs> <laughs>